It's one of those things where, you know, you hear, take something off your plate. Yeah. And I like to say, well, why don't we take away the plate and give them a saucer? If I only have a saucer, it's going to get full sooner. And then I can't take anything else. So you can't give me another administrative policy to complete and things like that because I don't have room for it. Hello. Dr. Desiree Alexander, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be sitting down with you here at ISTE. We're back live in person at ISTE for the first time in three years. And you can really feel the excitement, the energy here. I'm wondering what's most exciting you about being back here in New Orleans and being at ISTE? I would say feeling the love. So that's something I would add to the excitement and the feeling that you're feeling is the love. Just seeing people that you haven't seen in so long, giving them a hug, um, you know, talking to them in person is nothing like it. Nothing like it. Absolutely. Could not agree more. Now, we are here to talk about the myth of the superhero teacher. This is something you refer to. Yes. And I'm very interested in this conversation. And I'd like to start with your definition of that myth. So when you say there's a myth of a superhero teacher, what exactly does that mean? Well, I remember even when I first became a teacher, you know, I would like get little, you know, trinkets and signs that say, you know, you're a superhero. Teachers are superheroes and they have the superhero sign. And it was very positive, right? It made me feel like a superhero. It made me feel like I can do anything. It made me feel um, powerful. However, as I've gone through my career, as I've gotten out of the classroom and done administration and now, you know, in a consulting and nonprofit space, I've learned that it's very detrimental. And that's what I mean by the myth of the superhero teacher. So one of the things that you need to think about when you think of calling a, a teacher a superhero is superheroes don't get paid. Superheroes don't need self-care. Superheroes do, you know, go above and beyond with really little to no anything, appreciation or anything like that. And I think it's detrimental because it's one of those things is where people think of you as a superhero. They think of you as doing anything, being altruistic, doing everything you can without a second thought to yourself. And we have to get away from that in education. Educators are professionals. And I like to say that they are humans that do extraordinary things. They're not superheroes, right? They are humans. Now we do extraordinary things. We build generations but we're still human. And when you take that human element out of it, I think that just that, you know, it's not the only thing, but I think that causes some of the problems that we see in education today. It's interesting. It's supposed to be a term that is positive. People will approach you even when you say you're a teacher and say to you, oh, wow, thank you so much. You must be a superhero, that sort of language. But it sounds like what you're saying is that that is actually inadvertently perhaps causing some of these mindsets that we kind of have to do everything or be everything. Yes. I'm curious, where do you think that that idea came from, this idea that a teacher is a superhero and, it, and somehow that teaching is kind of different than other professions in that sense? Um, I think it came, you know, I think all of these ideas that we have that, you know, turn out to be detrimental come from two, two avenues. So I think one avenue is it did come from a place of, of good. It did come from a place of, well, I'm just trying to tell you how much I appreciate you, right? Um, so that's why I'm calling you a superhero. I think that's the highest compliment I can give you. So that's what, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. I would rather you give me pay, and I would rather you give me respect, and I would rather you treat me like a professional. Um, but you know, whatever, we'll, <laughs> we'll ring it back. Um, but I think on the other end, it is placating it is right like yep. if you think about you know how we kind of baby our students sometimes like oh yay da, da, da. and I think it's that like yay teachers you're a superhero yay but we're gonna completely ignore you in the legislature or you know like it, it's very demeaning and very placating so I think it comes from two different avenues just to get to this really detrimental point yeah, that's a great point as well, that it almost allows people to not do something tangible right. to address the issues that we're facing. Right. And we're actually seeing repercussions of that playing out right now. You're reading about teachers leaving the profession yeah. in droves. I wonder if there's a connection between teachers leaving the classroom and this 
myth of a superhero teacher. Absolutely, because the thing is, is if I hear that I'm a superhero, right? I hear that I'm supposed to be be everything to everyone, do everything. There's no way you can live up to the perfection of a superhero, right? There's just no way. But if, you know, especially if I'm a new teacher, I don't have any experience, and I'm thinking that that is what I'm supposed to be, it's heartbreaking when you're not that, especially if you look around and you think everyone else is that, which is not true. Um, you know, we think, you know, we perception is reality, right? Even though that other teacher is struggling as well, just no one's talking about the struggle, so everyone else looks like they're magical and superheroes. Um, but it's, it's nothing that we can live up to. So instead of being realistic and telling teachers, hey, this is an awesome profession, we do so much for our kiddos, we go above and beyond, but we also have to take care of ourselves, but we also have to make sure that we can continue to go above and beyond. The only way we can do that is by demanding that we are treated as professionals and that we take care of ourselves, right? And have others who are supposed to lead us and take care of us do that as well. Yeah, so that last point that you just made about others helping as well, something that we often hear too is that teachers need to figure out how to do less, just do less, less is more. And something that's always frustrated me a little bit about that phrase is, well, what am I supposed to cut? Right. What, what, what less thing, what am I not supposed to grade? Am I not supposed to contact families? Am I not supposed to plan lessons? Right. So I'm curious, do you have a thought about that? Is there something that teachers should prioritize? Is that something that as an individual teacher, I'm, I'm supposed to kind of figure that out? Because I think that has been something that I've really had a struggle trying to figure out what to do. Yeah, it's one of those things where, you know, you're here, take something off your plate. Yeah. Right? Hey, if you're a teacher and you want to start taking care of yourself, take something off your plate. And I like to say, well, why don't we take away the plate and give them a saucer? Right? Like, we can't tell them to take something off their plate when we have rules and, and I'm not going to say administration because I hate how we pit people against each other in education now, like teachers against administration, teachers against parents, like we gotta stop doing that. Mm -hmm. We have enough issues to not fight each other in house. But, you know, I'm, I'm gonna say administrative policies um, and things like that that are put down that, how do, you, how do you tell me to do A, B, C, D, and E, and then tell me to take something off my plate, but you can't take anything off your plate. So that doesn't, you know, what, what are you telling me to do? So I like to say, instead of giving them a plate, give them a saucer. And what I mean by that is then if I only have a saucer, it's going to get full sooner and then I can't take anything else. So you can't give me another administrative policy to complete and things like that because I don't have room for it. So we as, as the outside people outside the classroom, we have to give them a saucer. We can't tell them to just break the plate and then have nothing. That's not, it's not fair and it's not logical. So administrators, leaders, policy makers, we have to take something off their plate or like I said, just give them a saucer. Yeah, that it's the responsibility actually of the supervisors, the administrators yes. in the building who are assigning tasks. I'm curious. Because if you're assigning the task, mm -hmm. then you, you need to be the one to dismiss the task. Right. So there are going to be some administrators who are on board with this and understand, I hope, the need to take things off of their teacher's plates. If a teacher is watching this and they are in an environment where it's maybe not the culture there and they are in need of advocating for themselves, do you have any suggestions for what an individual teacher could do to empower them to take back their time, take back the actual kind of roles that their job is supposed to entail? Yeah, I want to, thinking about that question, it makes me think about one of the things I talk about in my classroom management class, which is that one day. And all teachers have that one day when they pack up all their stuff and they're like, I will mail the school their keys, they can take all these posters, I'm done. Right, we all have that one day, it is normal. But we don't talk about that one day, right? We just kind of keep it secret and keep it to ourselves. But what I also tell my teachers is, if you're having that one day every day, or if you're having that one day once a month, that is not normal. 
So the thing is, this kind of what you're saying about, you know, if you don't have that power to speak up for yourself, you need to look around and say, am I in the right environment? Um, we have a lot of teachers leaving the profession because of that. And what I say is, hold on, hold on, hold on, don't leave teaching, find your niche. And what I mean by that is you may be at, in the wrong grade level. You may be in the wrong content area. You may be at the wrong school. You may be in the wrong district. But like you've got to look around and go, what can I change? What do I have the power to change? Because we also get in this mindset of, well, I want to be out of school for 50 years. And that's what, it, you know, that's what a good teacher does. A good teacher takes care of themselves so they can take care of their students point blank period. So if you are in that situation where you feel like you have no power, you know, to at least say, hey, this is enough, I, you know, we need to talk about this, then you may be in the wrong location. We're actually at a time in the profession where we can kind of vote with our feet. Uh, yes, leave yes, sir. the school that we're at and find a better place. And yes. it sounds like that's what you're suggesting, that there actually can come a point, kind of a line where you're advocating because I think, I think that is a key frustration mm -hmm. that really, realistically, for some of these changes to happen, it has to happen at the administrative level. Yes, it does. Yeah, I or like that. Or becoming an administrator. Or become an administrator so you can start making decisions, yes, advocating for teachers. Yes, Absolutely. Sir. I know that you're presenting here at ISTE about Google productivity tools, and that's, that's largely your niche to talk about different Google apps and ways that teachers can optimize their use of those apps. I'm curious if you think there's a connection between some of the productivity tools that exist and teachers finding little ways. I'm, I'm Sometimes I'm reluctant to say that, but finding some little ways to take some things off of their plate. Do you think that that's a reasonable suggestion or reasonable to ask a teacher to do? Yes and no. Okay. Yes and no. I think, um, you know, if I was sitting here as a presenter, I'm like, well, yes, that's why I teach Google for productivity and, you know, some of these Google tools. And, um, you know, one of my niches is Google, but I also talk about, you know, how to do this in the classroom with classroom management, how to do this in the classroom to have power and things like that and educational leadership and things like that. But, you know, yes and no. I think it would be so simplistic to be like, yes, just use a Google tool and everything will work out. Like, no. That's, that's not realistic, right? Now, I think that if you learn how to be more productive and work smarter, not harder, it's going to help, right? It's going to help in certain areas. It's going to help lessen the time that you do certain things, but it's not going to solve those big issues. Like, let's be real, right? Yeah. It's not going to solve you feeling lonely. It's not going to solve you feeling, um, you know, not empowered. It's, it's not going to solve that. Um, those are going to take bigger issues. That's going to take a bigger conversation about equity. It's going to take a bigger conversation about cultural responsiveness and not just in the classroom, but in the school, right? Because we can't just say be culturally responsive for our students. We also have to be culturally responsive for our teachers. So I teach that when I am talking to educational leaders, you actually have to learn your teachers and build their culture into this school, right? So that's going to take bigger, bigger issues than just technology in general. Yeah, it's refreshing to hear. I, I think I can sometimes too get in that space of mm -hmm. very easily look at all this technology that exists that can empower you and make the job more doable, but you're right. And I think it's important to actually continue to put that perspective forward that absolutely there are some things we can do, but let's also be realistic right. with a productivity tool is not going to solve all your problems. No, it's going to solve your day to day. Right. right, like, oh, like I can check email quicker now because I have a zero inbox, or my Google Drive is organized and so I can get to stuff quicker, but it's not going to solve I feel lonely in my classroom. <laughs> it's not going to solve that. This is just not. Right. Some of these strategies that you're teaching teachers to do in their classroom and engage students more, um, I wonder, do you think that again, kind of getting to a place of there's an individual teacher who is looking to improve their day-to-day -day experience a little bit. Are you of the mind that if a teacher is implementing some of these strategies to create a little bit more engagement, a little bit more interactivity, that that is also potentially a way to empower teachers to bring some, some joy, some uh, element of 
um, agency back to their teaching, even if they are kind of in a situation that they feel like is not optimal or that we know isn't optimal? I think so, I think it's because it builds confidence, right? Mm -hmm. The more that I'm successful, and that's another kind of loaded word, what is success, right? Um, but it's, the more that I'm successful in the classroom, the more that I see my students blossoming, the more that I see that what I'm doing is making a difference, it's going to make me more powerful. It's going to make me feel like, okay, well now I have a voice. Like I, I know what works. And then when you come to me with a policy that doesn't, I'm going to speak up for myself because I know what works. So I, absolutely, I mean, that's what experience does for us, right? It, you know, we, we see what failed, we see what works, and it helps us go, well, no, 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 I'm not going back to that. So you need to change or we, or I need to change. Yeah. So um, yeah, absolutely. I think that the more that you find success in education, the more you want to be successful in education. Yeah, you're, so you're finding success too, and you, and you want to start sharing this with other teachers. You yes. want to kind of spread that and that can be such a positive thing. You also suggested, let's get more teachers into administrative roles. And I know some people that are really passionate about being in the classroom sometimes are hesitant to do that because you're moving farther away. It feels right. like from having that direct impact on students. So how do you see a teacher who is moving in that direction? They are They've been empowered with some strategies. Now they're maybe moving into doing some professional development and then they want to move up and perhaps start leading a school. What advice would you have to a teacher who is interested in doing that, even just advice in general, and how do you do that in a way that keeps a rootedness in that in-classroom experience so that you remember what it's like? I think anytime a teacher wants to leave the classroom, I tell them to stop and rethink. Because the thing is, I always question, why do you want to leave and why do you want to get into this new role? Whether it be consulting, whether it be educational leadership, whether it be going to the, uh, to the library, which I did, ooh, librarians. Uh, whether it is, you know, going into counseling or whatever you're thinking of doing, why do you want to do it? You know, knowing that why is going to be very, very powerful. So if you're saying, well, I'm just going to do this because I'm tired, sweetie, you're going to be tired of anything that you do. It's called work and it's called life. Right, so it's just one of those things where we're like, okay, so why do you want to move? And I do want to put an asterisk on what you said because one of the things I get upset about is something I was told when I was in the classroom. I had no um, inkling to leave the classroom and I was told, well, I mean, you're too good. You need to be an administrator. And I was like, I dare you. I dare you say that to me. So how little respect are you putting on a classroom teacher? Think about that, that I'm too good I need to leave the classroom. Like, wow, that is a slap in my face. And again, some of those things that, oh, I meant it for good, but it wasn't a good, for, like, you're disrespecting everything that I do day to day. So I do want to say that first. I never push, you know, like, well, you just need to go into my, no, if you want to be a classroom teacher for 50 years, I will honor you. I will call you a great person. Keep doing what you do and thank you for doing it, right? So, but if you do want to leave, the first thing that I do say is find your why. And that is going to keep you rooted. Because if you say, well, I want to go into administration because I want to continue to help my students on a larger scale, because I want to help more students, because I want to help teachers figure out their why and figure out their passion, and then it's going to keep you rooted. If you say, I want to get, go up because I want more money, which is not that much more money, but I want more money, you're not going to be rooted. If I want to go up because I feel not empowered in the classroom and I think as an administrator I'm going to feel power, that's the wrong reason, right? So as long as you can find that right reason, and I have had people tell me some of those reasons, and I'm like, okay, well, we need to think about that, right? We need to think about is that a good reason? And if you do tell me a reason like that, I'm also questioning why you're in the classroom to begin with. Like, you know, so why are you even here? So I think that why is what, what I usually lead them to. Now, let's say you're on the other end of this conversation and mm -hmm. you're an administrator now. We definitely mm -hmm. have administrators in the Absolutely. audience who are, who are likely watching this. And you want to just improve your practice. You want mm -hmm. to help address this issue that clearly, I, I know the vast majority of administrators do. They yep. want to take more off of teachers' plates. I they, agree. they want to make their teachers' lives better because their life is also going to be better. Right. What suggestion do you have as someone with 
administrative experience, what are some concrete things that an administrator could do uh, to, to help facilitate that if right now you want to make a change for the upcoming school year? I'm going to say number one, be more transparent, right? Let them know that you want to make that change. Let them know like, hey, this is what we're going to be working on. We want to change the culture of our school. I'm going to build you up more. I always say don't call yourself a leader until you've made other leaders, right? That's what that's your role is to make other leaders, whether they leave the classroom or not, because leader is not a title, right? There's a lot of leaders that are classroom teachers right now. So I don't do the whole title of leader. So, um, but don't call yourself a leader unless you've built other leaders. And I tell classroom teachers that too. Have you built student leaders? If not, you're not a leader. So that's number one is the transparency of, hey y'all, we're gonna work on this. We wanna work on, I wanna work on building you up. And then asking for their advice. I always say you can't motivate someone if you don't ask them what motivates you. It's a very simple concept, but we just want to assume. And I always say assumptions are the, you know, they will kill education. All these assumptions that we make. So if you want to help me, then ask me how to help me. The other thing is don't silence me when you are trying to help me. So you can't say, okay, shut up, shut up. I'm going to, I'm going to help you right now. It's like, well, that's not helping at all. Right? So be transparent. Hey, we're going to work on this. And then actually getting those committees together, actually talking to your teachers one-on-one to say, what can, you know, what can I take off your plate? How are you feeling? You know, what can we remove? Because again, it's, in, it's that cultural responsiveness, right? Looking at the individual and equity, looking at the individual versus just looking at your whole staff as a whole staff. So I would say those are the two first steps to get started. One thing that I know I always experienced as a classroom teacher was just feeling a lack of time. And yes. I used to at least say that I wished that occasionally an administrator would come in and take my class for a day or something like that to have a planning day to myself. And I felt like that experience-based learning, essentially, or kind of ability to reconnect back to the classroom could also be beneficial for the folks who are leading the teachers to just be reminded mm -hmm. about what it's like. Do you think that's a good idea? Is that, and you kind of hear that a lot, is that mm -hmm. something, yeah, that let's do that, or mm, maybe not? So, okay, I'm gonna go back. I wanna give a shout out to Marco French, who's the Louisiana Principal of the Year. And that's one of the things that he does at his school in Shreveport, Louisiana, is, you know, tell, like, take, take the class from teachers, you know, let them do other things. Now, this is what I will say to that. Not every teacher wants that. So ask your teachers what they want. Because I was the teacher, if you would have come into my classroom and said, Desiree, you can go. I would go, and go you can go. We got stuff to do. <laughs> like That would not have been, like the type A that I am, that would have, like I would have, that would have annoyed me to high heaven. <laughs> like get out of my face. Let me teach my students. We do not have a day to waste on whatever this is that you're trying to do. <laughs> Leave me alone. So again, ask your teachers like that was something that you were looking for i would look at it as a nightmare so ask your teachers and then if that's what then go do it for him she said i just want abc right it could be something small that would make me feel appreciating it ask your one size does not fit all this is multiple means of engagement according to universal design for learning we're Beautiful. always talking about <laughs> learner variability with students. We're trying to help teachers to implement practices that, that adequately address learner variability. What a great way to model it, yes. to actually ask and co-construct experiences for teachers. Yep. I really, really appreciate that yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. So I know you have some upcoming projects. Tell me about some of those projects and what you have in store. It sounds like you have all kinds of amazing things coming up. Yeah, mom, like as soon as you said it, my mind was like, wait, what? I don't have anything coming up. Uh, yeah, so I, I was like, I don't have anything. So <laughs> that, in, That's okay. I was like, wait, <laughs> do I? Uh, so in July, we have a, um, we do webinars, Educator Alexander webinars. 
at least once a month, but usually way more than once a month on Saturdays. Um, but we have a summer series coming up with the company Spaces, where they're going to come every Friday for two hours, um, virtually of course, and let us know about their product and let us know like how to actually use it and implement it for good before you get into the next school year. So. Um, so that's going to be really awesome. And you can go to educatoralexander.com and click on upcoming events. And you can register for all the other webinars that we have coming up, including the summer series. Um, also have a book that will be coming out, I think, next month um, through EduMatch Publishing. Shout out to Dr. Sarah Thomas. Um, and um, that is going to be on educational leadership with a, um, it's educational leadership, but it's really test prep for the SLLA test prep. Um, test that like about half the nation takes. So that should be coming out hopefully next month. And I think just everything else is just, you know, stuff that always happens. So yeah, those are the two projects that come to my to the top of my head. You also have a YouTube channel. Oh, yes. Obviously, we do YouTube. And so if we are looking to just find out about these upcoming projects, to hear more about your work, to see you on YouTube, sounds like go to your website and... Yes. Every, I always say everything is in one spot. So educatoralexander.com. You can click on YouTube and it brings you directly to my YouTube channel, which I love. I love my little YouTube channel. Um, and I do five minute tips and all the webinars are recorded and put on there. So um, I think it's like a little treasure trove of information. And um, yeah, so everything's on my website, either upcoming events. You can subscribe to my newsletter there. If you just click subscribe, it has all of my social media handles. You can, you know, follow me. I do Twitter the most um, and, you know, sign up for my newsletter and all that good stuff. So as long as you can get to educatoralexander.com, you're good to go. Well, Dr. Alexander, it's been so wonderful chatting with you. I feel like I could chat with you all afternoon. We have to roll into the next panel and yes. we're really excited about that, but I am thrilled to have been able to sit here and chat with you, to meet you in person, somebody yes. I've followed for a long time virtually. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your time here in New Orleans at ISTE. Well, thank you. I appreciate you guys having me. Of course.